In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. There is an old joke in seminary, at least in Virginia Seminary, and I suspect this is probably true elsewhere as well, that you can tell where the most difficult lectionary passages, passages are in the liturgical season when the rector has the seminarian preach. <laughs> still doesn't make these passages any less easy to hear, to work through, or to preach on. And in reading our market passage for today, I was reminded of a story from a very close friend and mentor of mine in Arkansas. His name is John Farthing, and he's a United Methodist pastor, uh, now retired, but was for many years the theology professor at the undergraduate uh, college that I attended. And throughout that entire course of time as a professor, he also pastored congregations. And uh, John is from the southern uh, Virginia Piedmont region right outside of Lynchburg. So he has this really rich, deep, resonant uh, cadence and voice and just a, a thrill to listen to. Um, and so he was well known for his, his homiletical ability, his engaging and thoughtful sermons. And he was invited to preach at one of the preeminent United Methodist churches in Little Rock, not long after they had built a new building. And this was not just a new building. It was their uh, entirely new worship space, a multi-million dollar project with this incredible stone church um, seating in the sanctuary upwards of a thousand people, state-of-the-art AV system so that they could broadcast their services on the local television station. And John said he wrestled with what to say to them. He kept trying to figure out what passage he was going to preach on, what word God was giving him to offer them in that space. And he said, and then it came to me, I was going to preach on Mark 13. And I went and I preached that no stone will be left upon another. And you know, funny thing, they never invited me back. <laughs> and we can laugh about that, and it's certainly a humorous story. But the truth of the matter is, we find ourselves in, cir in similar circumstances. We have a beautiful stone building here. We're in a city with numerous beautiful stone architecture. And yet, what does Jesus say today? But that no stone will be left upon another. And that should give us pause. And while I hope I don't get in trouble with our uh, capital campaign or with our uh, stewardship committee, the truth is that all of this is impermanent. And we're called to be stewards of our resources, we're called to use them wisely, but we're called to use them in their finitude for the glory of God and for the coming kingdom. These structures are not the ends in and of themselves. These are the means to the end of proclaiming the kingdom the means to the end of being prepared and alert for Christ's return. So it is that we come to our market readings today and begin to wrestle with the difficulty of this passage, the difficulty of the apocalyptic language in Daniel. And I'll admit, these aren't easy passages, and they are places where we should wrestle and places where we should do deep reflection on the text. And I find it interesting, too, that this particular passage in Mark and these particular readings that we're dealing with today come at the very end of ordinary time because they offer a good framing and a good transition for us as we head into Advent. Advent, which comes from the Latin root Adventus, which is approach or arrival. It's that time of the year where we prepare for not only the birth of Christ,
but also the second coming of Christ. It's that anticipatory preparedness, that anticipatory waiting for Christ's return. And we hear over and over again, every year in the three-year cycle, whether it's Matthew or Mark or Luke, that admonition on the first Sunday of Advent to keep awake, as Matthew and Mark say, or to stay alert, as Luke says. And as we begin to make that transition this week, going into Christ the King Sunday next week, and then actually stepping into the first Sunday of Advent the week following, we should be mindful of that framing. We should think about our readings today in the context of that preparedness, in the context of that alertness, and what it is that Christ is calling us into in being alert and being prepared. It's interesting, too, that this market passage is chocked full of Old Testament references. The admonitions Christ is offering us today and offering his disciples in the passage were nothing new. They were struggles that were true in first century Palestine as they are for us today in, first, in 21st century America. And it seems pretty clear to me that the implication that Jesus is calling his disciples back to, the implication of his words here, is that they need to be more authentically grounded in their expression of their Jewish faithfulness. The biblical scholar in his Anchor Bible Commentary, C.S. Mann, wrote this about the whole of Mark 13. He said, contemporary Judaism was concerned with the aggrandizement of the temple, with an external glory, while Jesus had been demanding attention to the inner meaning of Israel and her vocation before God. So he's calling his disciples back to a place of centeredness in the tradition. He's calling them back to a place of preparedness for the coming kingdom. And that's not something to be feared or to be anxious about. As Jesus says, be calm. And as C.S. Mann continues, he talks. He says, in the midst of the turmoil, there would be false messianic on the part of those claiming to act with the authority of the Messiah, and the member of the infant communities, the members of the infant community, were not to become involved in such movements. For all the trials and tribulations, the community was to watch, pray, and trust. And how true is that of us today as well? Yes, these passages were challenging, they certainly are, but they shouldn't be anxiety provoking. They shouldn't be worrisome because we know the ultimate end. We know that God will prevail and that the kingdom will come. And it is for us to trust in that and to be calm in the midst of so much turmoil and uncertainty. The truth is, brothers and sisters, that the extent to which these um, uncomfortable words, the reality of the difficulties that we faith, face, the extent to which we become anxious about them is the extent to which we are further and further removed from the gospel and from God. These texts and our anxieties about the world are often approached with fear and trembling, and I dare say, even in the church, they are often viewed as things best left avoided. But we can't avoid them. We must confront them, and we must look and search and pray for what it is that God is saying to us today. And so it is that I want to offer you two observations from what Christ says in his admonitions to his disciples. First, at the very end of chapter 5, he says, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And second, he says in verse 7, And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. 
So the two admonitions Christ is offering us are this. Stay vigilant so as not to be led astray by false teachers or heresies. And second, to stay calm in the midst of difficulties and unsettling times. So let's step back and unpack that for just a minute, both of those admonitions. First, staying vigilant so as not to be led astray. The truth is that this was as much a difficulty in first century Israel as it is for us today. Jesus was reflecting in that moment on the history of leaders who had led the people of Israel astray. Whether it's Deuteronomy 13, 1 Kings 13, Isaiah 30, Jeremiah 23, Micah 3, there are numerous examples over and over again where the leadership of the people of Israel had fallen short of their obligations, fallen short of their leadership, and fallen short in their trust in God. And yet Christ is saying to his disciples and saying to us, be vigilant even in the midst of poor leadership. Watch for the coming kingdom. Be prepared and be centered in your faith so that you know and can identify when such false teaching arises. And as I was thinking about that particular passage, I was, often, I was also reminded of an exhortation that comes in the examination. It's actually a question, not an exhortation, but a question that comes in the examination for priestly ordination that was present in the 1662 prayer book all the way up through the 1928 prayer book. And that examination question was this, will you be ready with all faithful diligence to banish and drive away from the church all erroneous and strange doctrines contrary to God's word, and to use both public and private monitions and exhortations as well to the sick as to the whole within your cures, as need shall require and occasion shall be given. And while I dare say that we as clergy sometimes struggle with that, to name those places of error, those places of strange doctrine that we need to call the people of God back from, it is also true that we as the whole people of God should diligently, faithfully, compassionately call each other back. Call leaders back when they go astray. Call fellow brothers and sisters back when they go astray. It's not just an admonition to the priest, but it's an admonition to the whole people of God. And then we have the second question of staying calm in the midst of difficulties and unsettling times. One of the realities of ordinary time lectionaries that you may not know is that not only do we have this uh, option between the Epistle and Old Testament reading, but there are two Old Testament readings throughout ordinary time to choose from. And today's second reading, and I would encourage you all to go home and read this passage and reflect on it this afternoon and evening, comes from 1 Samuel 1. And it is the story of Hannah and her struggles in her barrenness. Hannah is married to Elkanah and is also the second wife to Penea. And Hannah, in her barrenness, is ridiculed by Elkanah's wife is questioned by Elkanah, not harshly, not judgingly, but he wonders why this is such an issue for her. And yet, for her, she knows that this is her calling. And so she pleads with God over and over and over again to relieve her of her barrenness, to make her with child. And she eventually goes to the temple and begins praying in the temple and even in that moment, even in her moment of deep despair and prayerfulness, the priest in the temple, Eli, questions her and says, how can you be drunk in the morning thinking that that's what she is? And she explains herself and explains her pleading before God. And Eli blesses her and she goes home and she does bear a child, her son Samuel. 
who goes on to become a great prophet in his own right. And so her faithfulness, her consistent turning back to God, even over the course of a lot of silence and a lot of uncertainty, is for us an example of how we remain prayerful, how we remain steadfast, even in the midst of our own turmoils. And we hear that too in our collect for this morning, where we are called to hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest Holy Scripture. These are for us not simply observations, but they are our guideposts. They are our, um, our offerings from the tradition and from Holy Scripture as to how we move forward, how we commit ourselves to staying alert, staying prepared, and staying ready for the coming of God's kingdom. And then, as I said at the beginning, there's the question of our resources. We have this beautiful building. We are blessed with a richness of abundance in terms of what we're capable of, uh, of doing as a congregation with our financial resources, with our commitment of time and personnel. And how are we using all of that to advance the kingdom? Not only should we be rooted in our prayer and study of scripture and in our worship of God, but also rooted in our works of justice and our works of compassion in our works of mercy to the world, we are also called to be prepared in the way that we give, in the way that we so richly help and bless those around us. So as we look towards Advent, as we reflect on our readings today, let us redouble our efforts to pray, to study, to center ourselves in the Bible and in our faith, and also to turn ourselves anew to the works of outreach, to the works of ministry that we all live into day in and day out. Amen. Amen. Amen.